Last week, we talked about vision. We discussed vision. We talked about what it means to be a part of a bigger vision than yourself. The importance of that. But we also talked about the importance of having that vision and being a part of a vision that's relevant to you. Not simply to be a part of a vision that's bigger than yourself, which is the first and starting point, but the need that every person in this room needs to have a vision that is personal to yourself. That doesn't mean that vision is something of the future. Because let's be honest, some of us really don't know what tomorrow holds, and we think we do. And how many of you are sitting here today in a different place than you thought you would be? Hello, Antioch West, right? <laughs> let's just... And so we understand the big vision. We understand the need to be a part of the big vision. But sometimes our daily, our, our, our personal vision may be a daily vision. Let's be honest, we go through seasons where vision is just getting from the morning to the evening. I know your spiritual people, you don't ever go through that. But for us that are just trying, we go through those periods of time. But one thing we discussed last week, and we'll go back into this just briefly for those of you that weren't here last week. We discussed the reason and the, and the benefits and the desire that we need to be a part of vision. We need to have vision. Because the Bible is very clear that where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, there's no direction. Where there is no vision, one translation says, you run scattered. So we understand the purpose of vision. People without vision become aimless. They don't know where they're going. they got no direction. They're undisciplined. They really tend to remain stagnant. People without vision seem to be at the same spot today as they were five years ago. Become very stagnant in their walk with God. And the fourth thing is that people without vision really have very little fruit in their life. Let's be honest. I don't care how much you profess to pray. If you truly are a prayer, there's fruit. I don't care how much you profess to read your Bible. If you read your Bible, there should be fruit. Not too long ago, I had the opportunity. I was talking to someone. They said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. They, were, they wanted to ask me a question. And I, and I knew this person, and I knew what they were involved in. And I'm not saying to say yay or nay on what they were involved in. That was between them and the Lord. I'm not their policeman. But I knew what they were involved in. I knew their lifestyle choices. I knew the things that they were doing. And they prefaced the whole conversation. Before they asked me the question, they prefaced it by saying, well, I pray. In fact, I pray all the time. I can't stop praying. Okay. If you think you're going to convince me that, I wasn't born yesterday. Because there was no fruit in their life to the fact that they were praying all the time every day. Because you can't get close to Jesus without there being fruit in your life. What did they say about the disciples when they walked? They said this, we recognized that they've been with Jesus. Walking with Jesus leaves a recognizable mark. So there's little fruit with no vision. But we talked about the fact that vision is a biblical term that can be a little lost in translation. So we talked about last week really what vision was not so we could find out what vision was. We talked about the fact that without having vision, here are certain symptoms that you have in your life. And if you've got these symptoms in your life, that's because you lack vision and you need to seek God, who's the God of vision. You don't need to seek God for vision. You need to seek God and let God give you vision. Totally different. People seek God to get vision, but we need to seek God and God gives us vision. Because if we seek God for vision, we want our vision. But if we seek God, He gives us His vision. Difference. 
And so we discuss this. And here are some conditions of people that will affect the fulfillment of your physician, of your vision. First and foremost is some people have no relationship with Jesus Christ and therefore cannot receive vision. Put up on the screen Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say to you, therefore, testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the Gentiles and the rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their mind. Verse 18. Next verse. We'll get there. Ephesians 4, 18. There we go. Having their own understanding darkened, being alienating from their life because of their ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. If you don't walk with Jesus Christ, you cannot see. So to have vision, vision starts first and foremost with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot separate the two. The second part of the effect of of fulfilling a vision are some people are believers who only live for themselves, and are not concerned about God. Very selfish. They live for themselves, for what's good for them. Some people are believers who have received a vision, but they're not obedient to that vision. Some people are believers who have received a vision, but don't know how to fulfill that vision. They have tried it, but whatever they've done, for whatever reason, it's failed. Some people are believers who have received a vision from God, have embraced a vision, and they're working to fulfill the vision they've received. So let's take this for a moment a little farther because we talked about. Let me go back just for for a fresher if I could. We talked about using vision, biblical vision, and comparing that to natural vision. Right? And we discussed what does natural vision do. When I say natural vision, I'm talking about Your eyes. What does your eyes allow you to do? Because if we can look at what natural vision does, God always used the natural to illustrate the spiritual. We're called the body of Christ. Does that literally mean that we're a physical body with arms and legs? No, he used the body to represent what 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 the church is supposed to be. So oftentimes we see the scripture use physical representations or natural representations to give spiritual significance. So let's just for a moment go back and look at what do my natural eyes teach me. First of all, my natural eyes help me see my destination before I arrive. Because my vision can see where I'm going before I get there. The second thing, it gives me the ability to make sure steps to avoid stumbling. Vision allows me to navigate so I can see potential things I need to navigate around. Number three, it alerts me to danger. Vision alerts me to danger. Four, it gives me balance. We talked about all these last week. Five, it shows me how my present actions impact my immediate future. Number six, it helps me accomplish everything more quickly and most of the time simpler because I can see. It gives us perspective by helping us to see how the part relates to the whole and how the whole to the part. Most importantly, it helps us enjoy the ride. But let's go a little farther today for the next few minutes. Some of you today suffer from different conditions in the eye. Some of you today are farsighted. Some of you today are nearsighted. Some of you today have astigmatisms. Other of you today have had different parts of your eyes that have been affected. And because of that, you've needed correction to those things so that you can see. So let's just go a little farther on this sort of journey and finding out vision and the importance of vision. And what did we go back to last week? And I want to remind us this week, why are we doing this? Why not let's just preach something that's going to stand us to our feet. We're going to shout, yay. Nothing's wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But don't forget, too many times we're, 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 we're touched by our emotion, but we're not transformed in our mind. 
We talked about last week how God desires to be transformational, not emotional. Why do I say that? That comes from 37 years of experience of watching people hear the word of God. It inspires them emotionally. They come down front. Oh, God. Share, they shed 365,000 tears, soak the carpet, and leave. And by Tuesday, nothing has changed. Nothing. They're sincere. Yes, very sincere. Nothing sincere. There's no, I'm not saying there's no sincerity. But their emotions are changing. They're not being transformed in their mind. I don't know about you, but I want to see fruit in my life. I don't want to be the same person next year as I am this year. I want to change. I don't want to just become emotionally affected. I want to be transformationally affected. And that word transformational in the Bible means a metamorphosis. It means the idea of taking a caterpillar to a butterfly. I was not born to be a caterpillar. I was not born to be a caterpillar. But inside my DNA, there are wings that are going to help me fly. But to get from where I am to where I need to be, there's got to be a transformation that takes place. That's why in a crisis or a cocoon moment in your life, when you come out of your cocoon, the biggest change in your life is not the way you feel, but it's the way you think. Your cocoon changes the way you think. Because let's be honest, if that butterfly comes out of the cocoon but still thinks he's a butterfly, a caterpillar, his wings are worthless. But in that process of the cocoon, that butterfly goes from being a caterpillar to a butterfly but also has to understand when he comes out of that, he's no longer a caterpillar. I'm no longer attached to this ground, but I've been given the ability to soar above what I'm in. And I don't have to stay there. But you know what? Too many believers are walking around with wings folded up, walking around with their head held down like they're a caterpillar when God's called you to be a butterfly. And we're moping around saying, well, oh, you, I'm holding on. I'm just down here on the ground scooting along the bottom because I'm just a caterpillar. And God's looking at you and said, but I gave you wings to fly. And so you come and we get our wings all. We practice on Sunday. But when we walk out on Monday, we go back to our caterpillar life. But I'm not just a butterfly on Sunday, but I'm a butterfly on Monday. I'm a butterfly on Tuesday. I'm a butterfly on Wednesday. You've heard me tell this before, but it's like the church lost their pastor. It was a church of ducks. The duck church lost its duck pastor. So the duck church went on a search and found the new duck pastor. The new duck pastor took the pulpit for the first time on that first Sunday morning. And he began to quack to his congregation. He began to tell them how great they were. He began to tell them how they were fly. And they all quacked in agreement. But it was done. They waddled home. I can't tell you how frustrating it is to come and proclaim what God can do. But watch people waddle home. They come, and you know what? And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm on this, and I'm not trying to beat up. I'm just trying to get us. We've got to think differently, folks. We've been on this journey now for six months where we've been on this journey of changing the way we think about what church is and what it means, right? We're, not long, we're no longer trying to use the word service because that's not what the Bible says it is. It's a gathering. We're no longer trying to use the word church like we're going to church. We are the church. So if we're going to go there. Let's go all the way. But it's no point of me coming to church, hearing the, hearing the pastor quack away and me flapping my wings and just creating a bunch of dust, but waddle home. I was born to fly. I was born. So how do I get there? It's here. It's got to start with allowing the Holy Ghost to change the way I think. Because the Bible says, as a man, what? Thinketh. 
so shall he be. As a man thinketh. So let's go a little farther here. Let's look at some conditions of the eye and how that would relate to spiritual vision. Farsightedness. Anybody here suffer from being farsighted? Anybody? Couple. We got a couple in the back over there. Farsighted simply is this. It's a condition where a person can see distant objects very well, but have difficulty seeing objects that are close up. Objects that are near will appear blurry to people who have farsighted vision. What does this condition tell us about spiritual vision? Far-sighted believers are one who have great vision for the future and what God is going to do in their lifetime, but don't know how to focus on the things that are at hand and help them get to their destination. Far-sighted people are people that are looking at the end result, but are not looking at where God has them now. Far-sighted people want to talk about the ministry of what God's going to do. Well, I'm called to do this, and I'm called to do that. But yeah, honey, you're called to do what you're doing right now. Well, I'm called to be in this ministry. I'm called to do that ministry. I'm called to do that. No, no, no. The Bible says whatever your hand findeth to do, do with all your might. So that means you might start off as a toilet cleaner, but be the best toilet cleaner you can be. Because you don't know in the process of cleaning that toilet, you're going to get revelation that God's going to give you that when you get to where you're going, you're going to need it. But see, too many people are looking out. And that's sort of this whole thing in Christianity that drives me crazy is we all talk about, oh, we, we, we sort of kick the can. We're about to get my blessing. I've got my thing on. God's my ministry. What's this? What's that? And we don't allow the Holy Ghost to deal with where we are right now. If your child came to you right now, my son, it's amazing what kids think about. He's five years old. He'll be six in three weeks. Was it yesterday? It was last night. His mom had given him a bath, and, and I was getting him, and, and she was taking care of the other two, and when, you're, when you have three, you got to team up. It's a team effort. Everything's a team effort. So she was helping out. So I was taking him, and, and I was getting him dressed and getting him dried up and getting his PJs on. And he said to me, he said, Dad, do I need to get a job? I said, well, you know, it wouldn't hurt around here. I, just, I said, uh, uh, no, buddy, I think you're okay. He said, what kind of job do you think I can get? I said, well, I'm not really sure what job you can get, but I tell you what, why don't you just focus on where you are right now? Just focus. It'll come one day. Because you know what? For a five-year-old, we don't need to talk about. I, he, we were driving the car. I don't know what's gotten on his, his job thing because this wasn't the first time. We're driving down the car, in the car one day, and he said, Mom, do I need to get a job? She said, well, no, no. He said, what? What am I going to be when I grow up? She said, well, buddy, you, you be what the Lord wants you to be. He said, what am I going to do for a job? She said, well, you need to do what the Lord wants you to do for a job. He said, what if God tells me to work at McDonald's? <laughs> she said, well, buddy, if God tells you to work at McDonald's, I think you work at McDonald's. He goes, nope. <laughs> I'm going to tell God, no, God, no. He got some learning to do about following the Lord. But the point of the matter is at five years old, what good is it for him to think about where he's going? He's just trying to be where he is right now. You got to learn to crawl before you can learn to walk. You got to learn to walk before you can learn to run. Stop looking at those who are sprinting before you and you lose track of the fact that you're just learning to crawl. It's okay. It's okay. I don't, I don't, you don't look at one of these precious babies that are back there. Sister Sarah, how old is Harper now? Six months. I don't think anyone walked back there in that beautiful little baby and say, what's wrong with you? How come you're not running? She's learning how to hold her head up straight. We're not trying to make her run. Some of you are so worried about where you're going that you're failing at where you are.
So far-sighted. Then there's the other side of that, near-sighted. That's people, that's a condition in your eyes where people can see close objects very well but have difficulty seeing objects that are far away. Objects that are far away will appear blurry to people who have near-sighted vision. What does this tell me? That tells me in a spiritual context there are too many people that are near-sighted and only care about the temporal. They only care about the here and the now. And guess what? Their entire life. I can tell you if you're nearsighted by listening to you pray. If you let me come in your prayer closet and listen to you pray, I can tell if you're nearsighted. Because your prayer life is consistent upon everything that has to do with right now in this moment. Oh, God, help me right now. Oh, God, I'm going through this. Oh, Lord, I need. It's all about right now. It's the moment. And so when you get nearsighted, you're so focused on the temporal that you forget. We sang, we talked about it this morning in, in Unlocking the Bible. This world's not in my home. I'm just passing through. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And people that are bound by temporary, temporal and become nearsighted are people that ride the circumstantial roller coaster. Hallelujah. When everything in your life is great, you'll shout with the best of them. But the moment your life goes down, you come in here and you're moping. What's wrong with you? Oh, I'm just going through it. Come on. We all know people like that. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Don't look around. We know people like that. There are people that create drama when there is no drama because they need drama. Hallelujah. And so the, the idea that when you ride the circumstantial roller coaster, you have to make sure your circumstances are very indicative of how you feel. And so in that case, you, it's just, there's just your walk with God. And when that's the case, God forbid that you have major crisis in your life because those major crisis moments bring you to a screeching halt because your entire world is wrapped around what you see at this moment. But to know that I've watched some of you brothers and sisters have convicted me, and I mean that sincerely. I've watched you walk out of situations that have happened that have been life-altering situations, but I've watched you keep your head up. Smile on your face, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not because you're better, because you never lose sight of the what's to come. Forgetting those things which are behind me and pressing forward to the mark that's in front of me. You've heard this illustration before, I talked about it. I don't do it as much anymore. I don't not to lament you my physical conditions, but ever since my hips hit my hip surgery, I don't do it as much as I used to. But I remember years ago, I, I would run. And I remember, I'm not very, I don't really like to run. I'm not big on running. I'll do it. But I'm not big on running. I'm not a huge runner. There's some of you that can run with the wind. I'm just more just trying to make it one step at a time. And I remember, you, there, was, there was this particular point that, that in my house, where I used to live and used to run, on the way back, I'd run on this long stretch, and you could, you could see different marks. And about mile four, when I wanted to quit and call my wife and say, please come pick me up, I don't want to go back anymore. Because you realize when you run, the farther you go back out, that means the farther you got to go back. So there'd be days, you know, I'd feel ambitious. And I'd start running, and I'd get about three miles away. And then it, the reality of it would hit me. I got three miles back to where I'm going. That's a very depressing thing. And so here's what I would do. I couldn't, let's be honest, most of us, we don't live every day thinking, today we're, I'm going to heaven. Because let's be honest, most of us, heaven is just, it's out there, right? So how do I keep a future goal that feels like it's not something that's so far out there. So when I was running, there'd be times I'd be so tired that if I'm running along, literally, I'm like, I got to get to the end of that carpet. <laughs> 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 and 
and I get to the end of the carpet, I'm like, I got to get to the stop sign. And if I kept my mind off where I was, and I just looked at the, what was in front of me and needing to get to that next moment, I found myself I could keep going when my brain was telling me to quit and go home and eat a cookie. <laughs> you know what? There's sometimes, I got to be honest, when I leave Sunday, I feel like if I could just get to next week. Because that's where I am. That's not a place I want to live. But that's the place I am. So you got far-sighted, you got near-sighted. How about this one? An astigmatism. What is an astigmatism? It's an irregular curvature of the lens of the cornea of the eye. It is most common, it's the most common vision problem. It may accompany nearsightedness or farsightedness, but astigmatism is a lifelong condition. It may worsen slowly over time, but usually it remains stable throughout life. An astigmatism is usually caused by the irregular, irregular shape of the cornea. However, sometimes it results in irregular shape of the lens. So what does that mean as far as a believer? A believer with an astigmatism, now watch this. This is important because this is what we've been up against the last six months. A believer with an astigmatism are a people who have been raised in a certain culture or tradition under the influence of a particular spiritual DNA. But their DNA profile is not balanced or has not been shaped by biblical truth and results in a warped vision and is skewed. I've watched people that the word of God speaks to them, but because of the way they were raised, they can't see it. Completely different. It's completely lost to them because they can't see it. I've watched people that God has... That, have, that, that God has shown truth to, but have walked away because that wasn't what granny said, and that wasn't what mama said, and that wasn't what daddy said. And this astigmatism causes them to have a warped perspective. But see, astigmatism not only affected by the spiritual, but in the vision, astigmatism can be affected by the way I was raised. Because let's be honest, some of us were raised in very abusive environments. Some of us were raised by being told every day repeatedly, you're no good. You're a failure. You'll never be anything. You'll never amount to anything. You're never going to do that. What's wrong with you? Why can't you get anything right? And that causes us to be raised and as we get older as adults everything in our life is built around this astigmatism because of the way we see so God says I'm a butterfly but I see myself as a broke down caterpillar why? because that's what I was told I was told or because there's multiple types of astigmatism sometimes astigmatism Maybe what I was told, the environment, but also maybe events that take place in my life that cause me to have a different and warped perspective. And people with spiritual stigmatism can never see clearly. They're never able to clearly see vision or anything else because everything is filtered through the reality. Let's be honest. One of the new crazes out there today, if you've never done it before, it's really actually kind of, kind of neat. I think it's neat. It's what's, what do they call it right now? Virtual reality. Right? Because your eyes control everything. So if I can change what I'm seeing, it can actually cause my, my body to react to what I'm seeing. So I, my kids, I... I, I I actually preached this several year, uh, weeks ago, months ago, and brought in the, go the goggles. But you can buy these, like, goggle things that you can put your phone into. And so I bought it for my kids to have fun with. And on your phone, you can choose, like, a roller coaster. Or one of the ones was, like, this uh, merry-go-round swing thing that went up and spun. And literally... It's hilarious to watch them put that on because even though they're not on the ride, their body is... Their body is reacting not to where they are, but their body is reacting to what they see. 
Because what they see is shaping their reality. And even though, I mean, literally, I tried it. And I don't really get sick necessarily on rides. But I got on this one that was a swing. It's a swing thing that just like spins around. And I'm on that thing. And I'm like, I'm getting woozy. I'm getting a little nauseous. I'm getting woozy. I'm like, I got to take that thing off. I wasn't on the ride. But my eyes were telling me. And because my eyes were telling me a reality, it started to affect literally the way my body was reacting. So today, here's the deal. My vision controls my reality. And my reality causes me to, to determine everything about me. But that reality is not always the truth. Because you know what? My vision causes me to have a reality. And Sister Owens, that reality causes me to have feelings. My kids were like, oh my God, we're going up the hill. And I'm like, that's the reality. In truth, what they were feeling wasn't true. But you couldn't tell them that was the case. And some of you today, i got to be honest with you, telling you something is pointless because you don't see it because of what you've been through has caused you to Completely warp what you see. So how to do that? I believe, isn't that one of the things, I don't know this, I didn't, I didn't look this up, but isn't one of the things that laser surgery does? Anyone ever had LASIK? Anyone have LASIK? Kelsey, their couple, doesn't help fix that problem? Sort of. Um, you had it, they... they So they changed the problem you were having and put it in there. Yeah. So he had an astigmatism, but the surgery. There you go. So what do we need? I need a spiritual surgery. I need to get close to Jesus so Jesus can change the way I see. So let's go a little farther. We're almost done here. Let's go a little farther. Cataracts. Cataracts are the clouding in the eyes of natural lenses. The lenses lie, lies behind the iris and the pupil. When a person has cataracts, it's difficulty seeing. When believers have spiritual cataracts, over time by allowing experiences of the past to cloud the vision of the present and future. Things of the past cloud my present and my future. How about dry eye syndrome? It is an insufficient lubrication and moisture of the eye. Believers with dry eye syndrome are people who have not kept themselves bathed in the water of the Word and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. How about muscular degenerate? It's been a long day. Muscular degeneration. Slow down there, Joel. Muscular degeneration is the degeneration of the central portion of the retina. What does this tell us as a believer? Believers who exhibit muscular degeneration are people who have a difficult time staying on their target. They have, they have a problem keeping the main thing the main thing. Can I just stop for a moment? And say this, I know it's simple, and it's a simple thing, but if you haven't heard anything I've said today and I've lost you, bring it back with this one thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. I've said this before. I've watched too many people that have majored on the minors and have minored on the major. Do you know what the main thing is? Right there. J E S U. Yes. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. Simple. What good is it if you know all these things? What good is it if you can do all these things, explain all these things, and you're so good of all this, but we miss the main thing, which is Jesus? What good is that? What good is it if I cross all of my T's and dot all my I's, whatever that means? But I miss the main thing, which is Jesus. If I get Jesus, I get everything. 
Can't you hear what we've done? All of this whole thing we've done the last six months. What have we been trying to do? We've been trying to get back to the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. It's Jesus. It's Jesus not just on Sunday, but it's Jesus on Monday. It's Jesus on Tuesday. That's what the difference between a Christian and a disciple. A Christian may only see Jesus on Sunday, but a disciple is Jesus every day. This is not that complicated. It's Jesus. Jesus. It's not rules. It's not regulations. It's not what is and the do's and the don'ts. Do you know right now I could put you in a, in a room that was sealed. No windows. One door. We would seal the door. We would not put any contact. We could put a metal chair in that room. Nothing else in that room but a metal chair. And with no external things going on and you being sealed from the outside world, you still have a sin problem. Because as long as you're in that room, there's a sin problem. So you can't blame it on the fact that, well, this and that, the devil made me do it. The fact is, I need Jesus. I need Jesus every day. Because I know some of you, and I don't say this about funny, I mean, some of you are good people. In fact, there are some people, there's not much difference between before they were saved and after they were saved. They're good people. Others, such were some of you. <laughs> the difference between your B.C. and your A.C. is completely night and day. But even though Good people, you sweet, kind, loving people. We all have a sin problem. And a sin problem makes me have to focus on him. i got to have him. I can't get away from that. I never can get to the point where I don't need him. I need. Him. And so my point is, guess what? You can be in this thing. So don't tell me if you start. The reason I said all that is not only because you have a sin problem, but don't tell somebody that if you stop doing this, you're going to go to heaven. <laughs> Sorry, it just kind of gets me sometimes. We get so caught up on what we're not supposed to do that we lose sight on the fact what we are supposed to do. And I don't care if you stop doing everything that you thought was the rule book. If you forget the main thing, and that's Jesus, you've got nothing. Nothing. So stop looking at what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do and just get back to the main thing. And that's J-E-S-U-S. We need more love and less spiritual policemen. Because spiritual policemen want to write you a spiritual ticket. But instead of writing you a spiritual ticket, why don't you say, let's get you to Jesus and Jesus can take care of it. Jesus be a fence. I'm trying. Jesus be a fence. Drives me crazy. Where do we think that somehow if we do everything perfectly, that makes us saved? God forbid when we're going to sit there and we're going to be gravely shocked when Jesus asks us to give an account of our life and he doesn't ask us of all that minor stuff that we've been focusing so much on that we become prison to. He's going to ask you. Did you know me? Did you know me? Did you know me? And did I know you? Not what was, how many check boxes did you have in your spiritual goal chart? But did you know me? I can't get past this, and maybe this is where we're going to stop today. Because this ultimately is what this is all about. And everything we're doing in the entire last six months, it's been a focus of this. And that is, there needs to be a passion in us to know Jesus. Not to know a church. Not to know the preacher. But to know Jesus. 
I've used this before, but let me finish this again. Let me say this again. I've used this many times. In fact, I've, I, I spoke at a youth, a youth meeting several weeks ago, and I, I challenged them. It was last, actually last week. And I challenged them with this. And I still haven't found anybody that would do this. Nobody will do this. But maybe today, for the first time, someone will do this. I have a challenge for somebody. And if you win the challenge, I will buy you a brand new car. I'll pay all the payments. I'll take care of the insurance, and I'll pay all the fuel. So, but you have to accept my challenge first. So back before you get excited and start picking out leather, cloth, you just need to hear my challenge first. Here's the challenge. You give me everything you love to eat. Give me the full list of it. Everything. I mean, give me all of it. Give me what you like to snack on. Give me what, what, what your, main, your favorite foods are. Give me what your favorite desserts are. Give it all to me. Do you like steak? Do you like fish? Do you like chicken? Do you like all of the above? Do you like, do you like mashed potatoes? Do you like this? Do you like that? Whatever you like. Or do you like pizza? Whatever. Hamburgers. Chicken. Fried chicken. Hallelujah. I could use some fried chicken right about now. Whew. 1210, it's about getting that chicken time. Finger licking good chicken time. I'll just ask for all of it. I'll give it all. What do you like? Do you like chocolate? Do you like pies? What do you like? I'll give it. We'll, and I will, I will fly in at my dime. The best chefs in the world. The best pastry chefs in the world. If you like barbecue, I will bring in the Bex Pitmasters going. We'll just put it right here. We'll just break it down right here. We'll smoke your ribs right there. Just let the Holy Ghost just fill this place. I'm really getting hungry now. Stop. My morning Pop-Tart is long gone. Woo. We'll give it all. But here's the deal. When you come back next week, at 9.45 to unlock in the Bible, you will be greeted with an entire spread before your eyes. We will have a seat just for you. I will even put your favorite movie up on here so you can be entertained while you eat. And you can eat away. And you can eat and you can eat and you can have it. We'll have drinks for you here. We'll have it all. But here's the point. Now here's the catch. At 12.30, you got to stop eating. Kitchen's closed. Everything's cleaned up. And you're not allowed to eat until next week at 945. But when you come back next week at 945, we'll have it all for you, baby. Everything else. Whatever you need. <laughs> I'll give it all to you. And next week at 945, you can start to eat. But you cannot eat anything after 1245. In fact, you can't even eat or drink anything after that. It's over with. Done. You can't eat or drink. If you even take a sip of water, it's my car now. You lose. So, there's the rules. Now, before we close this service, I would like to ask, would anyone like to take me up on that? We'll start next week. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm giving you the opportunity for a brand new car, no payments, no insurance, no gas. You can drive from here to California every week. I don't care. I'll pay the money. We can't do it, right? Because we know without these things, I can't survive. So what good is the car going to do me if I'm dead? Mm. So if I can't do that naturally, what makes me think I can come in here Sunday to Sunday and from 945 to 1230 stuff my face with the word of God, dance and shout with the best of them, but at 1245 I go home and I fast and don't drink for a seven days. No wonder we're not excited about heaven because we're not going to live long enough to see it. No wonder we're not spiritually strong. As we sang last week, be bold, be strong, for the Lord thy God is with you. Because you know why? When you don't have any fuel, your body begins to eat itself. 
And somehow today in the Holy Ghost, we could turn it on the real spiritual. We got spiritual skeletons walking around. Because you've got no spiritual diet. Because all you do is stuff your face on Sunday morning and you don't stuff. But guess what? When I wake up on Monday morning, yes, I'm going to need some spiritual, some natural fuel. But I'm going to need some time Monday before too late. I'm going to need to take my spirit and dip it into the well of living water. Because my natural man may be thirsty, but my spiritual man gets thirsty as well. And I'm going to have to step into that spiritual well. And I'm going to have to get a drink of And the more I begin to drink of that water, Something begins to get a hold of me. I don't feel weak anymore. I don't feel tired anymore because I'm getting that spiritual. And then when I get the bread of life in me with the word, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will have no fear because the Lord my God is with me. His rod and staff, they covered me. Rejoice not against me, O oh my enemies, for when I fall, I shall arise. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I begin to get that spiritual word, when I walk in, I'm not walking in weak and tired, but I'm walking in. Because I'm bold and I'm strong. Because I've been on a spiritual diet that's allowed me to grow strong. What would happen in your life? Forget coming back next Sunday. What would happen tomorrow in your own life? If you get up and say, you know what? I'm not going all day without eating. I'm going to get some food somewhere. And you get some spiritual food. I guarantee you, if you do that, you will see a transformation happen in your life. Transformation. Transformation. You know why some of us, we get, what's, the, what's all this about? This is so, this is so silly. This is so pointless. Because that's because you're going from, set, from Sunday to Sunday. But how about when I wake up Monday morning? As the old song says, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, the devil don't like it, but my mind is stayed on Jesus. Well, the devil don't like it, but my mind is stayed on Jesus. Well, the devil don't like it, but my mind is stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Then it makes you be able to sing, I'm going through. I'm going through. Oh, I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do. Why is that? I made up my mind that I ain't going to turn around. Say, I'm walking with Jesus Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'm going through. Or how about that one that says, when the devil comes to tempt me, showing me an easier way, I stand Flat on my feet, I throw my head in the air, I look him straight in the eye, I set my foot's on the rock, and my mind's made up. Oh, somebody, my mind's made up. Somebody turn around and ask somebody, what's your mind? Do you've got a made up mind? I've got my foot on the rock, and my mind's made up. Though I walk through the lonely valley and I drink from the bitter cup, will the devil comes and knock it, showing me an easier way? You ready? Let's declare. I stand right flat on my feet. I throw my. I 
look him straight in the eye. I set my foot on the rock and what? My made up. Well, I've got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. Though I walk through the lonely valley and I drink from the bitter cup. When the devil comes and knocking, showing me an easier way. Come on, say, I stand right. Flat on my feet, I throw my head in the air. I look you straight in the eye. I set my boots on the rock, and I've got my mind made up. Now turn to somebody and ask them, is your mind made up? Okay. Ask them, do you have a made up mind? Say and you tell them, say, if your mind's not made up, I've got a made up mind. I've got a made up mind. Come on, put your hands together. And give God some praise in this place. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? The ushers are going to come. Made up mind. I got a made up mind. I've got a made up mind. Some of you need to put that on your mirror at home when you wake up in the morning. You need to say that and declare it. I've got a made up mind. I've got a made up mind. When you're driving to work tomorrow, you need to yell out the window. I've got a made up mind. Praise God. Really quickly, we're going to take our offering here to, as we, we, we end this gathering. But just quickly, this Wednesday is our second episode or whatever you want to call it of Antioch West Live. If you don't know what that is, Antioch West Live is simply this. Instead of gathering together in a building, we're encouraging at least two or three believers to gather together. Preferably somebody not in your house. Somebody outside of your house. Gather together. Whether it's at a home, a coffee shop, wherever it is. Gather together with another believer. Maybe in your small group. Maybe outside of your small group. You're going to gather together at 7 p at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. You can have some light refreshments, talk with one another, encourage one another. At 7:30, we'll begin our live broadcast. You can see that on Facebook or on AntiochWestLive.com. You'll you can view that, and then after you're done, we encourage you. It's about 50 minutes long usually. We encourage you to spend a moment talking with one another, encouraging one another, praying with one another. This. Wednesday night, our guest is Bishop Wright. I'll be interviewing Bishop Wright. We'll be talking about some things that are not just out there, but we're going to talk about some very practical things. What the, what the Bible says church is, and also what we're going to talk about is how to study the Bible. We've been talking about unlocking the Bible, so we're going to talk on Wednesday night on how to study the Bible. So tune in, AntiochWestLive.com. Join together with another believer in your small group. Small group leaders, make sure you let your small group know. If you're not in a small group, you need to get in a small group. we got small groups today. Go to a small group if you want to go to heaven. It's a requirement to go to heaven. It's in that book somewhere. I'm trying to find it, but it's in there. I'm writing, I'm rewriting my own translation, and I'm putting it in there. Therefore, I say unto thee, go therefore to a group of smalls, and you shall be saved in Jesus' name. Go to a small group today. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for all the things you're ministering and challenging us with. I pray in Jesus' name. Bless your people as we give. I speak blessing in Jesus' name over your people as we give in accordance to your word. Would you come and give at this time as we worship the Lord? Praise God.